Hello, everyone. Our next presenter is Brad Bradley. Brad is a PE in the Production Support Office within the Central Office Office of Design. He is a Project Management Support Engineer and the FDOT's State ADA Coordinator. He was born in Tallahassee, graduated from FSU, and his entire professional career has been right here first working with three international bridge engineering firms for a combined 11 years. He has been with FDOT for the past 13 years in structures design, roadway design, and now PSO. He is married to a lovely wife, Heather, and has six beautiful children, four girls and two boys, ranging from the age of 27 to eight years old. Take it away, Brad. Well, hi there, and good morning, everybody. I'm going to be speaking on the topic of accessibility in design and construction. So on the screen, the first slide here is, is talking about what we're going to be talking about for the, the course of the next two and a half hours. First, we're going to have several slides on the overview of the ADA, and ADA is the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's a federal law. The next thing we're going to discuss is accessibility requirements. We're going to go over in, in thorough detail the requirements as they are presented in our design guidance from the Florida DOT. But uh, take heart that all of that information that you learn in about design requirements for ADA is not going to be lost on you in construction because it all has a direct translation from the design guidance into construction. So every, everything regarding ADA that's required in design has a comparable component in construction. I, I wanted to mention here on this picture on the left side of the screen here is, is an individual who is using a four-wheeled motorized mobility device. And you can see that the, the sandy surface there at the beach has been augmented with a, with a rollout mat. I think this particular vendor's product is it's from Mobi Mat, M-O-B-I Mat, Mobi Mat. But um but you can see that that mat provides a firm, stable, and slip resistant surface that is easily transversible by wheeled mobility de devices, whereas without that mat, the, the sandy surface would be very difficult, if not impossible, for an individual to uh to, to be able to get across. So that, that's just something that we've seen used successfully within department construction projects and uh, just wanted to make you aware of that. Okay, this is the first slide of the overview. You can see in the picture that, that uh, then President George Bush and he is signing the ADA into law. That was done on July 26, 1990 and, and one of the one of the phrases that he was noted for for using in his speech was let the shameful wall of exclusion finally come tumbling down i guess that kind of related back to his predecessor president reagan telling mr gorbachev to tear down that wall but barriers to accessibility exist in the pedestrian environment and and they do function essentially as a barrier or obstruction for a person with a disability so the signing of the ADA and the, pass, the passing and signing of the ADA was definitely a major advancement for um, helping people with individual or people with disabilities to gain uh, a level of independence. So, real quick, a uh, look at the history of civil rights in the United States. Uh, the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964, and it addressed specifically the, the categories or, or protected classes, if you will, of race, color, and national origin. And then in 1990, when the ADA was passed, uh, ADA became a civil right. And this was, this was made obvious as the intent of Congress because the ADA uses language that is pretty well identical to the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, specifically quoting a section that says, uh, that the ADA forbids excluding from participation in, denying the benefits of, or subjecting anyone to discrimination. So keep in mind that that now that we're talking about ADA, it's not just a, a DOT requirement. This is a national federal law, and it's a civil rights law. It's under the civil rights umbrella of laws, and violating 
the criteria that we're presenting in this in this training actually can be considered by the United States Department of Justice as discrimination. So you need to keep that in mind. This isn't just a, a DOT requirement that um, that you kind of wink at and get away with violating because it, it, when it comes down to it, this is a federal civil rights law and we don't want to be found as discriminating against a particular user group. You'll notice that I highlighted Title II. Title II of the ADA deals with public services, specifically governmental entities, whether at the state, county, or city level. But it, Title II addresses governmental entities have to make that they, all of their services, programs, and activities are accessible to and usable by persons with disabilities. Now, the, uh, at the bottom, the little note down there is, is talking about the Architectural Barriers Act of 1968 and the Rehab Act of 1973 were, were Congress's first attempts to address systemic barriers to accessibility. Uh, these are you know, just structural barriers to the, to the um, access to and, and usability by people with disabilities. The ADA when it was passed in 1990 and then saw, signed in 92, were dissolved the funding connection that was uh, existing with the earlier laws. The Architectural Barriers Act and the Rehab Act both required entities receiving government funds to essentially address uh, removal of systemic barriers, but the ADA dissolved that funding connection. So really all government entities, regardless of whether or not they receive federal assistance, are required to remove the barriers to accessibility. And you can see that that's covered in Title II. T Title III actually addresses barrier removal by private entities. That would be your gas stations, your movie theaters, your retail stores, and, and you know strip malls and so forth. So um, essentially the ADA is all-encompassing in, in protecting the rights of the, uh, the dis disabled group. This picture shows what is now known as the Capitol Crawl. This happened on March 12th of 1990, and it was used as a point to try to get across or to get the ADA passed by Congress. But a group of disabled protesters left their mobility devices, whether it's a wheelchair or crutches or whatever, they left their mobility devices and they began to crawl up the steps of the United States Capitol. This was to demonstrate to lawmakers that, that there, there was no easy way for them to access their country's own capital because of the systemic barriers. Um, these were architectural type barriers that limited their, their ability to access their own government. And unfortunately, we don't have the ability to, to share this video. This is a, a video that's slightly less than three minutes long that I would urge you to, to jot down the address there at the bottom of your screen, www.itsourstory.com. And I would urge you to take a, you know, take three minutes and look at this video, maybe at lunch or later, later this afternoon. Um, because it, it does a great job at conveying to the observers what systemic barriers to accessibility actually do for a disabled person. It is a huge um, barrier. It might as well be a, a brick wall or a, a, you know, a tall uh, razor wire wall in some cases because uh, a person with a disability, especially if they're using a wheeled mobility device, absolutely cannot access because of um, some of these violations. And we'll, we'll talk about that more as we progress along. But now we're to the actual requirements of the ADA. These are design requirements for the pedestrian environment. There are other accessibility issues when it deals when you're dealing with governmental entities we're, we're again we're talking about government services programs and activities specifically for this training we're going to be talking about accessibility requirements in the in the pedestrian environment and i want to note here that the united states 
government considers sidewalks that are provided by governmental entities to be a service. So that's why they're they're covered under the ADA as as a service program or activity. When we're talking about the accessibility in the pedestrian environment, you can boil down the ADA requirements to really just a handful of elements or categories. The first one being an unobstructed clear width. That one pretty much stands to reason without much need for further explanation. The next one is a protruding objects. You can think of this, if you will, as like a, a clearance window or a airspace above that unobstructed clear width walking surface that needs to be clear of protruding objects. And that could be, you know, by signs or equipment, or it could even be landscape material, either naturally occurring or planted. It also addresses running slopes and cross slopes, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment, running slope and cross slope. And the walking surface itself has to be clear of obstructions, as well as you have to have a special work, you have to adhere to special requirements for changes in level and how to address, appropriately address gaps in the walking surface, as well as the use of grates for drainage. Now, I want to note here that state projects are governed by the FDM, whereas local projects, typically referred to as LAP projects or local area program projects, that would be by cities or counties, are governed by the Florida Green Book. So you as, as construction managers need to make sure that when there's a question that you are referencing the appropriate guidance. State projects are governed by the FDM and LAP projects are governed by the Florida Green Book. Now, we're going to be discussing specifically the FDM, that's the FDOT Design Manual, Chapter 222, which governs pedestrian facilities. Uh, note that in addition to tap, Chapter 222, you have Chapter 223, which governs bike facilities. Chapter, chapter 224 governs shared use paths, which are used by both peds and bikes. And then you have 225, which covers public transit facilities. So um, that's, that just gives you a quick overview of the, the applicable chapters in the FDM. But specifically for this training, we're going to be discussing in depth chapter 222 for pedestrian facilities. Now note here that 222 provides the minimum criteria that must be used for pedestrian facilities within the SHS or the state highway system. The term pedestrians includes people who are traveling on foot or even in a wheelchair. And note that except where it's limited or restricted on limited access facilities, pedestrians should be expected on all of Florida state roadways. Because we're expecting pedestrians on the roadways, then we have to provide pedestrian facilities so that they are uh, kept out of harm's way with regards to the vehicular activity. And for those of you who may be involved in some of the design work or you know people who are designers, it, where the criteria of the FDM cannot be attained must be addressed or processed through with a design variation, which is, which is approved by the uh, district design engineer. In addition to the criteria that DOT has in the FDM or the standard plans or also in our specifications, there are other documents that should be referenced as guidance for the design of pedestrian facilities in the public right of way. And these include the USDOJ 2010 ADA standards for accessible design. I, I kind of refer to that as the ADASAD. You also have the United States DOT issued in 2006, the ADA standards for transportation facilities. And then you also have the Florida Building Code, the accessibility edition. And the, the FBC or the Florida Building Code covers accessibility for sites, facilities, buildings, and other elements. Okay, remember the ADA Title II is what covers public services and sidewalks are considered a service or a public service. Features or elements that are found along the pedestrian facility include sidewalks, but there's so much more than just the sidewalk itself. You also have to address curb ramps, 
which a curb ramp is the sloped surface that transitions, if you will, from the elevation of the sidewalk to the elevation of the roadway that's going to be used as a crossing. So that's the curb ramp. You have crosswalks, both crossing roadways as well as at-grade railroad tracks. You have refuge islands. That could be the, the pork chop island, as they call it, at turnouts at intersections and also median refuge islands. You have curb extensions, uh, pedestrian signals, public transit loading zones, pedestrian bridges, shared use paths, and of course um, you need to address street furniture as well. So pedestrian safety is probably the greatest focus and the highest priority for FDOT when we are planning, designing, and constructing the infrastructure that we provide. In order to effectively address that, there's the, these four items, our four uh, elements or categories should be considered. And this, this ties in directly to the DOT's Vision Zero, which is the activity that we are, are instituting, if you will, to, to, to try to, to provide from a design and construction perspective the elements and, and uh, aspects of the, of the infrastructure that will help us to bring down and hopefully arrive at zero fatalities and serious injuries. So these enhancements include maintaining a smooth, clean walking surface that's free of obstructions. That's actually a requirement from the ADA. Number two there addresses responsive and appropriate traffic control from the MUTCD. And you want to make sure you include appropriate pedestrian facing directional signage. And the picture into the immediate right of that, of that number two, uh, sh it shows you a pedestrian facing signage there that is kind of interesting. You know, danger sidewalk ends. Okay, now what do I do? So this this was actually on a state roadway, but we we'll, I won't identify the district that that it was in, but um, I think something a little bit more, let's say, aggressive could have been done here to to help make sure that this was a, a safe termini of the walking facility. Number three addresses the continuity of the pedestrian facility and making sure that the termini of the pedestrian facility at the end of the project or the project limits needs to have a continuous connection, whether it's a, an adjacent facility or a crosswalk to, to get to another facility, it needs to be continuous. And then finally, number four addresses the providing adequate lighting. There's a lot of bang for your buck as far as safety because lighting makes the pedestrian more visible to motorists as well as just providing for general safety of the pedestrian uh, along the roadside, especially in the evening and dark hours. Just a quick question on number three. Is that from the FDM or is that an ADA standard like on the continuous and termini connect to existing sidewalk? that that's an, an fdm requirement so it's it's a dot state requirement i'd have to look into whether whether it has origins in the ada regulations or not but in the state of florida yes number three applies that it needs to be continuous and have termini that exist uh, that connect to existing sidewalk okay here you can see again the the subject of continuity of the walkway is addressed in the fdm and it's actually referencing standard plans index 522 001. Uh, it says that the sidewalk must be continuous as depicted in the standard plans. And I, uh, I'm showing here that the general notes provide a lot of information and references that need to be addressed and uh, considered when designing and constructing the pedestrian facilities. Specifically, spec 522 covers sidewalks Detectable warnings, which we haven't talked a whole lot about yet, but we will, are covered in Standard Plans Index 522-002, and driveways and how to address sidewalks at driveways is covered in Index 522-003. Now, the, the little kinked note up there in the left that says ADA does not require sidewalks is to remind me to tell you that a lot of people have the misconception that sidewalks are required by the ADA and they in fact are not required by the ADA. But what the ADA does require is that where sidewalks are provided 
by the governmental entity that, that they must be completely accessible. In other words, they must meet the applicable design criteria for accessibility by, that is used by that governmental agency. And of course, in, in our case, that would be the FDM, the standard plans, and the uh, specs for road and bridge construction. So the ADA doesn't require the sidewalk, but where it is provided by the agency, it must be accessible. Okay, first we're going to address where sidewalks are provided. Again, this is not an ADA, federal ADA regulation requirement. This is a requirement by the state DOT. So sidewalks must be provided on all curbed roadways except where that's prohibited by that particular section of the Florida Statutes, 316.130. Paragraph 18, and the inclusion of sidewalks on short, isolated sections of curbed roadway is not required within the C1, C2 context classification. If you're not familiar with those, C1 is natural. It's a natural context, and C2 is considered rural. Um, so C1 and C2, if you have that context classification and there are no pedestrian facilities that lead to or from that location, then sidewalk is not required by the FDOT. The DOT does require sidewalk to be on high-speed curbed and flush shoulder roadways within the following context classifications. The C2T, that's rural town, C3R, that's suburban residential, you have C4, that's general urban, C5 is urban center and C6 is urban core. So if you're not familiar with those context classifications or with the concept of context classifications, you can look that up in the FDM in other chapters. I, I believe it might be in volume one of the FDM. If not, it's, it's covered in volume two. And then it's also included in the Florida Green Book. Again, the Florida Green Book is the design criteria that governs local agency roadways that would be cities and counties in Florida and then you also have to provide or need to provide sidewalk in the C1 natural context the C2 rural and C3C which is a suburban commercial context classifications when there is a demand for use demonstrated so where does the where does the sidewalk concrete get placed relative to the roadway well the furthest away from the roadside as possible is the uh, preferred order of desirability. So you can see there, number one is you want to place it as near to the right-of-way line as possible. That's as far away from the roadway as you can get. And then as you get closer to the roadway, you want to place it outside the clear zone. And then within five feet beyond the limits of the full width shoulder. And then finally at the limits of the full width shoulder. So again, just keep in mind that you want to, you want to try to keep pedestrian traffic and vehicular traffic separated by as much physical distance as possible. On this slide, we're addressing sidewalk on flush shoulder roadways. You don't want to provide that sidewalk again, same as the, or alluding to the what we just saw on the previous slide. You don't want to provide that sidewalk adjacent to the roadway or shoulder pavement, if possible. The sidewalk when it's placed further away from the, the roadside, needs to be transitioned back to the intersection when you have an intersecting roadway because that's going to meet the driver expectation and provide for a more functional crossing. And you can see in the picture here, this is, uh, this is on US 27 North in Tallahassee, just north of I-10 uh, at the Sam's Club, or it's, it used to be Sam's, now it's a Walmart. Um, but you can see that with the sidewalk being that far out removed, if you will, from the edge of the, the roadway, as you get to the intersection, the, the sidewalk has to be transitioned back closer to the main intersection so that so that pedestrians can, can cross in front of vehicles and not in between them. But further guidance on how to address that with stop and yield signs and so forth is covered in the, U, in the MUTCD Part 3 and also in the standard plans index 711-001. Okay, again, where does concrete sidewalk get placed? And, and also addressing the continuity of the pedestrian facility. If you have approaching sidewalk to a bridge and 
sidewalk leading away from where the bridge is going to be located, then obviously the sidewalk should be carried straight across the bridge. So if you have existing sidewalk, the bridge that connects those two points should carry the sidewalk across the facility. Taking it a step further, if you're building a bridge that does not currently have existing sidewalk on the approaches, but may include it in the future, the bridge itself should be designed and constructed to provide for that concrete sidewalk at that time, rather than trying to retrofit a bridge later down the road. It'll be a lot cheaper and a lot easier to do it with the original design and construction. Okay, continuing on with the location of the sidewalk, it should be provided on both sides of the roadway, but where it cannot be for whatever reasons or constraints, if it's only provided on one side, then you still need to provide appropriate and reasonable pedestrian access to des certain destinations like transit stops, uh, residential areas, places of work, stores, grocery stores, that sort of thing on the opposite side of the road from this from the sidewalk. So you want to provide mid-block crossings in that case. Now for 3R projects, that stands for restoration, rehabilitation, resurface. Uh, for those projects, typically you're milling and then putting back asphalt within the confines of the roadway section. In, in those cases, any sidewalks that are not otherwise included in the scope of that 3R project that are not in compliance with the FDM do not have to be reconstructed. So I don't know if I said that in a in an easily understood way. If you're if it's a 3R project and the sidewalk, the existing sidewalk is not compliant with the ADA, if it's not being if it's not already included in the scope, it does not have to be reconstructed. The exception to that, however, is that curb ramps and detectable warnings along the project limits do have to be corrected or uh, brought into compliance. Okay, now we're getting into the specific and particular requirements of the ADA and how the DOT's design guidance address it. The standard sidewalk width for the DOT, this is the minimum sidewalk width that the DOT should be providing, especially for new construction, is five feet. And you can see that in the uh, red oval over on the right side of the table there for C1 natural and C2 rural context. The asterisk to the width in the, on the left side of the screen says that the width is measured exclusive of the width of the curb. So to say that another way, you want to you want to measure your unobstructed clear width of your sidewalk is the clean edges, the, the clean edge lines of the concrete sidewalk itself, not including the uh, the top of the curb if the sidewalk is directly adjacent to the back of curb. So the top of the curb cannot be counted in that minimum width measurement. Notice at the bottom, note three with the arrow there, says that for three R projects unaltered sidewalk that is that is four feet or greater may be retained within any context classification. But notice the double red asterisk on the left corner at the bottom. The Florida Green Book in section C10A3 requires that a five by five foot passing space be required at intervals not to exceed 200 feet whenever the concrete is less than, or whenever the sidewalk rather, is less than five feet wide. So for concrete sidewalk or for sidewalks that are less than five feet wide, you must provide, and this is an ADA, federal ADA requirement that's just being echoed in the DOT documents, whether it's the FDM or the, or the Florida Green Book. If your walking surface is less than five feet wide, then you must provide a five by five foot passing space not to exceed 200 feet. Sidewalk width, um, continuing on that on that topic, if you have a an obstruction, typically a, a utility pole, let's say, or maybe a sign pole, there are some provisions that are written into both the FDM as well as the UAM, the Utilities Accommodation Manual, that let's say pre-approve some conditions, but let me emphasize that ideally these poles would be removed or, or relocated, if at all possible. 
but where it's not possible to remove them, there's an allowance for 36 inches for above ground utilities, and that can actually be reduced even further down to 32 inches, not to exceed 24 inches in running length. And that's only to be used where there is no practical alternative available to avoid that obstruction. The current federal ADA minimum width for the walking surface is 36 inches. The federal government has a has what's called PROAG, the Public Rights of Way Accessibility Guidelines calls for a minimum width of 48 inches, but it has not been officially adopted by the US DOT, so it is not the, the national standard. The national standard width is 36 inches. These proposed guidelines that I just referred to called PROAG calls for 48 inches, but FDOT, under the leadership of my predecessor as the state ADA coordinator, Dean Perkins, has by policy instituted a five-foot minimum width sidewalk uh, anywhere that we provide sidewalks. So the federal standard is 36. PROAG says to use 48, and PROAG, although it has not been adopted already, is probably, it, I'm, I'm hearing from my federal partners that it will probably be adopted as the national standard within the next month, few months or, or years. But of course, that's what we've been hearing since it was first issued back, I think, in 2005 or 2006. And here we are in 21. So who knows if that will ever be adopted officially. Um, we're hearing that with the new administration in Washington, D.C., that the likelihood of it being adopted pretty quickly is is high. But um, I guess we, it, we won't know for sure until it's actually adopted. So the federal minimum is 36. The guidelines from the Fed say use 48, and FDOT requires five feet. So FDOT in many, if not most, of the ADA accessibility requirement is more stringent than is currently required by the federal government. And the last bullet down there says um, 48 inches. You can reduce from five feet to 48 inches for signal light and sign poles. Again, if there is no physical alternative available for relocation. On this slide, this is a DOT requirement that is not specifically related to the ADA, but it is a requirement in Chapter 222 of the FDM, and it talks about what I typically think of as the utility grass strip. Um, this particular picture, though, is, is taken in downtown Tallahassee. It's on uh, US 27, I guess, South Monroe here, right at the intersection with US 90 Tennessee Street. But the, the, the lines, the blue lines they are showing are indicating the area of the, the roadway right behind the curb that's technically outside of the sidewalk area, but, but it could be paved or it could be grassed. And that, that width of that area should be five feet. And where parallel parking is used, the FDM says to consider the use of tree wells in this area. And that's exactly what the city of Tallahassee has right there. So that was a good picture for illustration of that point. Okay, this is an ADA requirement that DOT has, um, has imposed a, a slightly more restrictive requirement. But DOT requires a seven foot vertical clearance over the entire walking surface. So I mentioned earlier that the ADA accessibility requirements could be boiled down to a handful of categories, and one of them was protruding objects. Well, in the case of FDOT, again, we impose more stringent criteria for intrusions. We don't allow any protrusion of any objects within the entire walking surface. So you can see in the picture on the left that the grasses are beginning to intrude upon the walking surface itself. And in the picture on the right, uh, vegetation, in this case, it looks like a, a palm tree orchard, <laughs> a bunch of palm trees right here are growing out over the, the top of the sidewalk. So if you will, imagine your five foot minimum concrete width and along those neat concrete edge lines, shoot a plane vertically up for seven feet and there should be no intrusion into that 
area that's encapsulated by that airspace, if you will. There should be no intrusions or protrusions of anything into that. So it should be a clear vertical space up to seven feet above the walking surface. Now addressing grades and cross slopes. Here you can see um, my colleagues are, are measuring the running slope of this particular curb ramp. Well, for the sidewalk itself, if the sidewalk is is immediately adjacent to or a consistent separation from the back of curb, and that would be like, like that five-foot utility strip that we were just discussing, then the sidewalk grade or the running slope can follow the profile grade line of the adjacent roadway. But when the sidewalk is not adjacent to the travel way, for example, it's the sidewalk is located at the right-of-way line, then it is not permitted to follow the profile grade and you are limited to a five-foot running slope max. Beyond five feet and up to 8.3% or one, a one to 12 grade uh, is considered ramp criteria. And once you get above 5%, up to 8.3%, you have to provide handrails and level landings, and you're not permitted to provide a running slope that is above 8.3 or 1 to 12. Now, in the in the perpendicular direction to the running slope, you have the cross slope, and there should be enough cross slope to provide for adequate drainage, but that cross slope should not exceed at any time uh, the maximum of 2%, and that is the federal ADA requirement, 2% or, or 1 to 48, that is the federal maximum and any exceedance of that 2%, it could be 2.01, is technically a, a violation of the federal ADA requirements and we could be subject to a, a U.S. Department of Justice complaint. So that 2% needs to be looked at as a hard maximum with no construction tolerances on the plus side. Now, if the plans call for 2% and it's it's provided or constructed at 1.5 or or you know even down to zero, then as far as the ADA is concerned, it, that's not a problem. But then the issue would be just with the what the the CEI will enforce there. The DOT takes it a step further and says that a clear one foot wide graded area with a maximum one to six slope should be provided adjacent to the sidewalk, and you should avoid drop offs where possible and where they can't be avoided, they should be shielded, and that's covered in, in uh, Chapter 222, Section 4. Now, this is an honorable mention of Chapter 224 for shared use paths, but this is a, a clear example of a pedestrian facility that is not adjacent to or parallel with an adjacent roadway. So in those cases, ramp criteria applies so you don't have a problem up to 5%, but between 5 and 8.33% uh, is considered a ramp, and you must meet the ramp criteria, which includes, in addition to handrails, uh, you have maximum rise of 30 inches in between level landings, and your level landings must be as wide as the facility is and must be as, as long or deep as 60 inches or 5 feet in, in, uh, in length there. Okay, curb ramps and blended transitions. Standard Plans 522-002 covers the requirements for detectable warnings and curb ramps and level landings. And this is all in compliance with the ADA Standards for Transportation Facilities, the ADA STF. In the upper right corner or section of the slides, you can see that I've copied the general notes into the slide. This note A, 1A, is meant to show, emphasize that the minimum feasible slopes should be provided at all times. I review a lot of pedestrian facility plans and I, I often have to make the comment that the designers should not summarily use the 1 to 12 max ramp slope that's allowable but instead should actually design each curb ramp according to its unique site conditions and elevations and configurations to provide the minimum feasible slope. Because again, the ADA requires the removal of 
physical and systemic barriers to accessibility. And for a disabled individual who's using a wheeled mobility device, or maybe it's not someone who's quote unquote disabled, but maybe it's just an elderly citizen, the greater the slope of the ramps, the curb ramps, the more difficult it is for the individual to traverse that distance. So as a state transportation agency, we should be providing the minimum feasible slope in, uh, in those conditions. So rather than just slapping on the plans one to 12 max, we should be designing each individual location according to its unique configurations and constraints. Landings must hold to a 2% slope in any and all directions. So if it's 2% or less in any direction, it's considered level. That's what the, the, the that's the requirement for a level landing. And you want to maintain a single longitudinal slope along each side of the curb ramp. So no warping, if you will, of the slope within the curb ramp. You want to maintain the same slope on both sides and the slope does not have to exceed 15 feet in length. And, and I'll show a picture on the next slide that, that illustrates what that point is trying to communicate. And keep in mind for note D there that no joints are permitted within the, the sloped surface or the ramp portion of the curb ramp. Now on this, this slide, it's meant to emphasize the level landings. Again, the level landing has a surface slope of 2% or less in all directions. And you can see in the picture on the upper right, the landing is shown as five, five feet. You should consider that five foot to be standard, five foot standard, four foot minimum. Um, we'd like to provide DOT's standard five foot minimum everywhere, but where site constraints exist, then we allow in some situations to go down to four foot minimum as seen in the upper right. And the, in the lower left, this particular curb ramp standard is allowed where constraints are even more, more restrictive and we allow going down to three foot minimum. But let me, let me emphasize here again, for those of you who are uh, involved in design or maybe know some designers, we wanna emphasize the point that we wanna provide the five foot minimums that's a standard width everywhere. So hopefully designers will not easily resort to these four foot and three foot minimums, but rather we'll, we'll do some uh, heroic design gymnastics to try to maintain that five foot minimum standard. This picture is a picture that was uh, in, in my predecessor, Dean Perkins um, training presentations from, from probably a couple decades ago but it's a good picture to illustrate the point that it's so much easier to fix a sidewalk cross slope before the concrete is in the ground. So you wanna measure those, make sure that the, the forms get measured before the concrete hits the ground. And it's a whole lot easier to adjust the forms than it is to have to rip out a non-compliant sidewalk. Because again, any cross slope that exceeds 2% is in fact not only in violation of DOT criteria, but federal ADA criteria. And remember, any violation of any criteria from the federal ADA at the federal ADA level is considered to be discriminatory against persons with disabilities. And it could be subject to a complaint and uh, litigation from the US Department of Justice. On this slide, this is a slide again, borrowed from Dean's training from years ago because it emphasizes a couple of points that um, I could not find otherwise in, in current DOT documents. But the first bullet there about having a stable, firm, and slip resistant surface that is covered in our current documents, uh, the FDM chapter 222 and, and chapter 225 for public transit facilities, and then spec 522, which covers the construction of sidewalks, all of that addresses the, the stable, firm, and slip resistant surface. Then you have changes in level, and the one quarter inch is the maximum vertical allowable change in, in level. That's the, the diagram on the bottom center of the slide that's labeled one quarter inch max. So, one quarter inch maximum, uh, this typically is what would occur where you have adjacent sidewalk panels 
and then you have a differential settlement or you have the intrusion of tree roots underneath one of the panels starts to shift one panel up relative to the other. The maximum allowable vertical displacement at those joints is one quarter inch. And from one quarter inch up to one half of an inch, you can provide a, a one to two rise over run bevel there, which is typically accomplished by, by sidewalk grinding. But uh, above one and a half inches, excuse me, yeah, above one half of an inch, you're not allowed to have that type of vertical change in level. And for gratings, the last bullet down there, your grating needs to have one half inch max opening in the direction of, in the prominent direction of travel. So if you look at the, the uh, illustration there in the middle on the right, it shows that the predominant direction of travel is left right relative to the grating. So the, the grating's opening in that direction cannot exceed one half inch. This section of the FDM is again addressing the continuity of the pedestrian facility and that includes the curb ramps and blended transition. So what is a blended transition? A blended transition, uh, it says, for example, there, e.g., depressed corners, raised street crossings, or flush roadway connections. So it's uh, a blended transition is anywhere that the sidewalk elevation is at the same elevation as the street that's being crossed. So there's no need for a sloped surface or curb ramp. It's just a flush transition. But those need to be kept continuous and that, that also is addressed or, or required by shared use paths. Now I'm going to ask what you think is missing for the bottom arrow. What's missing at the bottom arrow? Device. That's truncated right. Domes. That's right. The truncated domes or detectable warning surface. That's right. Uh, anywhere that the, the pedestrian facility encounters a um, vehicular way, especially if that vehicular way is, is um, stop controlled, either with a stop sign or a signal. And if it's a, a main street, of course, you would provide the detectable warning surface. Now, a kind of a nuance to that requirement is indicated by the upper arrow. Uh, who can tell me what what's special there? That's a residential driveway. Well, one thing I see is the sidewalk continues through and through. It doesn't just turn into the driveway. The driveway actually matches the grade of the sidewalk. Yes, that's a that's a good point, and and that's important at driveways, especially where there's a there's a significant increase in elevation of the sidewalk from the street level, and the, of course the driveway is trying to blend or transition that slope up the driveway, but you also have the sidewalk that's going across the driveway simultaneously, so those slopes for the driveway and the sidewalk have to be harmonized, if you will. So that, that was a very good point. Also, the point here relative to detectable warning surfaces is that residential driveways that are crossed by sidewalks do not require detectable warning surfaces. And the, the thinking there, the reasoning there is that as a residential driveway traffic is going to be extremely low. So the detectable warning surface there would probably be misconstrued by an individual with no or low vision as a major street crossing. So residential driveways that are crossed by sidewalks do not require detectable warnings. Um, but that's that's covered in this uh, section 22, 222, section 2.2 of the FDM. Okay, so where are curb ramps required? And the, the simple smart answer is anywhere that there's a elevation change from the walking surface of the sidewalk to the roadway surface that's being crossed. So that would occur at intersections or driveways with curb returns. Um, you want to remember to provide a level landing at the top of each of those ramps. And then also at mid-block crossings, that's where a crossing has been established midway, if you will, between intersections. And that occurs frequently when the um, distance between intersection becomes um, excessive. Okay, when you have a curb ramp and there are nearby or associated surface features like utility covers and other types of installments within the walking surface, you want to, the, 
the first priority would be to relocate them out of the walking surface, especially off of the sloped surface of the curb ramp. There are some cases and times when that's not possible. So um, where that's not possible, you want to make sure that those surface features all comply with the ADA requirements so that the, uh, the walking surface is flush with and at the same slope of the adjacent surface as well as being firm stable and slip resistant now this is another question for you as the audience uh, i know we haven't addressed really yet much about the location of or the requirements of the detectable warning surfaces but if i tell you that the dot requirement for the location of the detectable warning surface in relation to the back of curb is that it has to be within five feet of back of curb what can you see here that might could have been done differently that would have been a, a better choice for the location of the detectable warning surface? Uh, they could have put them behind the boxes. That's right. And very simply, just move the detectable warning back uh, to closer to the gentleman's foot there with the, the water bottle that he's holding on to. Uh, move the detectable warning back away from the back of curb so that you have a continuous detectable warning surface across the full width of the crossing because in this case a person with low or no vision who is walking either with the, the use of a guide dog or, or maybe a white cane with a red tip um, they could conceivably walk right across the, the utility covers there and not realize that they missed the detectable warning surface and before they know it they're in the middle of the road so that that could definitely be a safety issue that would need to be addressed. And I think this this picture was taken during a QAR, quality assurance review. And I believe that um, that the district was gonna go back and, and see about uh, trying to determine ways that they could augment the top of those, the, the lids of those utility boxes with uh, the detectable warning truncated domes. Okay, on this slide, we're talking about curb ramps being in line with the crossing. It kind of stands to reason, but but we did want to put it in the uh, the language there to emphasize the point that you want to have your curb ramps in line with the direction of the crossing. And the note there about a maximum slope of 1 to 12, I put an asterisk there citing back to the index 522, which says provide the least slope possible. Don't just provide the 1 to 12 max because it's allowable, but try to design something if you're a designer or the construction folks should be trying to provide the least slope possible. Now, the, the middle paragraph there that says, at, at intersections where more than one road is crossed, provide curb ramps at both ends of each crossings. I'm not sure exactly what the, the part of the sentence in front of the comma means, I, if I was going to rewrite this portion of the FDM, I think I would just capitalize the P and provide and say provide curb ramps at both ends of all crossings. And the purpose for that is that you don't want to, as a, as a state transportation agency, you don't want to lead a pedestrian with a mobility disability into the roadway at a crossing without providing them a way to get out of the roadway on the other end of that crossing. Even if there's no sidewalk facility on the other end, if there is a marked crossing with a curb ramp on one end, there needs to be a curb ramp with a level landing on the other end. What they do at that point, I'm not really sure, but we definitely want to provide them with a way to get out of the, the travel way on the other end of that crossing. Now keep in mind that your crossing itself as it, as it goes from curb to curb still is required to meet the same grade and cross slope requirements as the sidewalk itself. And where that can't be met or, may, or attained, a design variation will need to be processed and approved by the district. Okay, this is the picture that I thought was much earlier in the presentation that shows or illustrates that, that 15 foot maximum requirement that I mentioned earlier. So if you can see from the curb ramp for the crossing that's that's coming in from the left side of the, the picture and it interfaces with that ramp and then the, the sidewalk continues up at kind of a, a sleep grade until it levels out at the grade break right there at the joint beneath the, the RGA 
uh, flag that's there. That length, in order to maintain your 1 to 12 max, does not have to exceed 15%. So to say that another way, if in order to maintain a 1 to 12 max slope for that curb ramp, if you would have to go out beyond 15 feet, then you don't have to. Just do the best you can within 15 feet. So again, I'm not sure if I said that in the easiest way possible to understand. Does anybody have any questions about what I'm trying to communicate there? I have okay. a question that kind of falls into this. Um, sure. I've seen in some areas where, let's say they're older state roads where literally we have no right of way. And you can see where the drainage structure is. So if you pull the sidewalk to the back of the curb, the right of way is on the back of the sidewalk, but you have the drainage structure. So in order to correct the slope of the curb ramp, you'd actually have to go and do almost a major modification to the intersection and drainage. Does yeah. that fall into this, even if it's not quite 15 feet out? I, th I think as far as this pr provision is concerned, that wouldn't necessarily apply. But I think what, what you would do in that case would be to work with the, the district design engineer and, and try to find a workable solution there. In some cases, a design variation is required just because you cannot construct something because of existing um, constraints. And like you said, moving that drainage structure would make it a huge issue and, and a very costly one at that. But let me emphasize this point, and my colleague with the FHWA Florida Division is fond of using the, the, the statement that we don't balance the department's transportation budget on the backs of the disabled. In other words, we cannot, and the FD and the ADA does not allow the use of, well, it's too expensive to be a good excuse. So really, whatever engineering effort we can make to try to make it work, we should be doing. Um, and, and if it gets to a situation where it's just not feasible or practical, then a design variation will have to be processed and approved by the district design engineer. I hope that answered your question. Now, the, the bottom asterisk note there says that if you have the 8.3% maximum ramp running slope, and that meets a counter slope of 5% uh, for the roadway cross slope, that it, that's a 13.3% algebraic difference. It's recommended to provide a two-foot level area where that algebraic difference exceeds 11.3%. And the reason for that is if you can imagine a wheelchair with the foot rests being used, if the counter slope at the interface with those two, those two slopes, the ramp slope and the cross slope of the roadway, if, the, if that counter slope exceeds 11.3 and certainly up to 13.3, then the, those foot rests will dig in to the opposing slope and potentially cause a, a flip over and, and seat ejection of the individual. So. Um, where that counter slope exceeds 11.3%, it's recommended to put in a level landing at the bottom. This is a picture that was taken real close to the Burns Building in Tallahassee. This is Cascades Park, a newly developed park by the, the city of Tallahassee in Leon County. But it was a good illustration there of the curb ramp with flared sides. The maximum slope of those transition slopes on the on the sides the, the the flared sides if you will is one to ten so but the the slope itself for the interface with the the top of the, the sidewalk is still limited to the one to twelve but those side slopes can be up to one can can go can go as as um, as steep as one to ten Okay, when you're altering an existing facility, sometimes you have site constraints and, and other conditions that will limit the ability to attain that 1 to 12 maximum slope. And where that occurs, the FDM allows you to go to a 1 to 10 with a maximum rise of 6 inches. You still want to provide level landings at all the appropriate places, which is at the top of the, the curb ramp, as well as directly in front of pedestrian push buttons. And that level landing in front of a pet pedestrian push button needs to be a minimum plan area of 30 inches by 48 inches. 
and the long dimension, the 48 inch dimension needs to be horizontally centered on the push button. And the reason for that is you can imagine that if the, the surface in front of the button was sloped, then a person in a wheelchair would have to release at least one hand from one of the wheels to push the button. And if the slope is uh, significant enough, they won't remain stationary, especially when pushing against the button. So the, the reason for the level landing there is so that the person can remain stationary while actuating that button. Okay, here's some curb ramp examples from Standard Plans Index 522.002. And you can see the level landing is demonstrated on the left, CRB image at the top. Um, in this particular situation, uh, it's saying four foot minimum. Again, I want to emphasize, try to maintain that five foot standard minimum everywhere possible, even if it requires a sharper pencil when you're conducting the design or trying to get it constructed on the ground. For this, the CRH on the right, um, that's a kind of an interesting configuration, but again, the important point that's trying to be emphasized there is to provide a level landing. In this case, it's, it's not labeled, but it is shown as four foot zero inches minimum. This slide I wanted to show because it emphasizes the point that was made a little bit earlier in that the curb ramps need to be in line with the crossing direction. You can see in the picture on the left, this is a depressed corner, which results in a flushed transition between the sidewalk landing and the adjacent roadway. And you see the, the placement of the detectable warning surface uh, in the option A is radial. It's a radial placement, but there is no, once a, an individual who is blind or has low vision is in that depressed area, there's nothing to indicate the direction of the crossing. So they're relying completely on the ambient sound of traffic. Now option B does provide a situation where they have a, a little bit more directional guidance because the, the curb on both sides essentially is, is detectable by cane and underfoot. And so they would know the direction of the crossing in those in those cases. If you see the the uh, picture on the right, ideally you would have a, a curb return, even if the the transition there is flush, even if it's a flush transition or a blended transition, we've called it. Providing a raised curb that provides direction information is still going to be probably the best and most preferred um, choice in order to communicate the direction of tra of travel for the pedestrian who is blind or has low vision. Okay, driveways, again, I said are, are addressed in Standard Plans Index 522-003. There's, they're also addressed in 330-001. That's for new and reconstructed driveways. And any driveway that is unaltered in a three-hour project is not required to be reconstructed, just like the sidewalk provision for 3R projects. So again, a 3R project is essentially milling and resurfacing within the um, within the roadway footprint itself and not addressing the pedestrian facilities. So with the exception of curb ramps and detectable warnings, unaltered driveways and sidewalks are not required to be reconstructed unless they are included in the, in the scope of the, the project to begin with. Okay, crosswalks. Crosswalks are marked paths where pedestrians can safely cross. And it's also the place where, uh, where drivers would expect to see pedestrians crossing the roadway. So there's guidance provided on, on pavement markings for crosswalks in 711-001. The ADA requirements for crosswalks, as mentioned earlier, have the same requirements for grade and cross slope as the sidewalk portion itself. So maximum cross slope on the crosswalk is 2%. So the, the crosswalk cross slope of 2% is the running slope, if you will, of the vehicular way. So for crosswalks located at signalized intersections or driveways, cross slope may exceed 2%, but not be greater than 5%. So I would, I would definitely encourage designers, especially, in, and of course, the construction side of the house to, to make sure you understand what's being communicated there as far as the ADA criteria. 
but DOT requires 2% max cross slope for the crossing if that if vehicles through that crossing can go through at full speed. In other words, it's a signalized intersection and, and a vehicle could have the green phase in which they don't technically have to slow down or, or certainly not stop if it's green. But if it's a stop condition, like a stop sign or a yield condition, then the DOT requires that the uh, cross slope, the maximum cross slope of the crossing can, can be made, maintained at 2%. And if they're allowed to go through at speed, then the maximum is up to 5%, not to exceed 5%. It gets kind of difficult to explain there because you're talking about cross slopes and you're talking about cross things. You're talking about the vehicular way. So the the running slope of the vehicle through the crossing is the cross slope of the pedestrian at the crossing. The running slope of the pedestrian in the crossing is the cross slope of the vehicle in the crossing. So you, you just have to make sure that you <laughs> that you understand which direction you're talking about and make sure you harmonize those slopes accordingly. And then also there's school zone information there for crosswalks that's provided in the, in the DOT manual on speed zoning for highways, roads, and streets in chapter 15. But I, I did want to mention again that chapter 222 covers DOT requirements for pedestrian facilities and all of the requirements are not specific to the ADA. And the reason for that is that the Florida DOT, again, under the leadership and guidance of uh, Dean Perkins, my predecessor as the ADA coordinator, has completely integrated ADA compliance into the way we deliver our transportation infrastructure. So I think Florida DOT might be one of the only, if not the only, state transportation agency that has completely integrated the requirements of ADA into all of our guidance for design and construction and maintenance. Um, so the reason I say that is if you're looking for specific requirements for the ADA in the DOT guidance, it may not be labeled as being a requirement of the ADA because all of those requirements are completely integrated. So just keep that in mind when you're um, when you're working through uh, chapter 222 is that the requirements there are for all of DOT's requirements and not just those related to ADA. So here on this slide, when your traffic volume, or excuse me, when your traffic generally, when your traffic increases as measured by volume, speed, and number of traffic lanes, then additional treatments should be deployed to increase pedestrian safety, and that may include the addition of signals, signs, beacons, and so on. Overhead lighting is another safety mitigation strategy that can be used there. Okay, for six lane divided roadways, especially when the crossing distance is greater than 80 feet, two stage pedestrian crossing should be provided. And of course the reason there again is to just, you're providing maximum safety for the pedestrian relative to the approaching approaching traffic. Section 232 requires the use of special emphasis crosswalk markings at mid-block crossings. And you can see illustrations of a mid-block crossing in the FDM section 230.6. And mid-block crossings are used to supplement uh, intersection crossings, especially where the intersections are separated by a great distance. And there's more guidance there provided in the MUTCD as well as the Traffic Engineering Manual and uh, other sections of the FDM, Chapter 230, Section 6, and 231, 3.4. These are the illustrations of the mid-block crossings, and I just show these to emphasize what is, a, I think, a, a pretty cool feature of these mid-block crossings in that the pedestrian is angled towards oncoming traffic once they reach the median. In both cases, in the one on the left, they're kind of angled a little bit towards oncoming traffic, and in the one on the right, they're positioned directly facing oncoming traffic, and that has been shown to increase pedestrian safety by making the pedestrian aware of oncoming traffic, but that's not specific to the ADA. 
That's just general pedestrian safety. If site conditions are identified that would obstruct the placement of the mid-lot crossing, then additional features should be considered, such as overhead signing, additional lighting. Um, you can also provide curb extensions or what's called bulb outs to improve the sight distance so that motorists can see pedestrians because they've been moved closer to the roadway or the travel lane. And then also mid-block crossings can follow the, the natural grade of the roadway, but that's only for mid-block crossings. And even at mid-block crossings, you should try to maintain the, the same running slope and cross slopes that are required on the sidewalks and, and, and at intersection crossings where that's possible to, to do. And you may have to adjust the, the roadway profile to attain those, those slopes. At grade railroad crossings, you want to extend the pedestrian facility through the crossing, and there are some requirements that will need to be maintained there. You can see here that the, the yellow truncated domes or detectable warning surfaces were appropriately placed. The yellow mat on the left is placed behind the roadway arm, that arm extension or traffic barrier that, that rotates down. The uh, detectable warning is placed behind that arm, so it will, it will not capture, hopefully it would not capture a pedestrian in between the, the two arms there, one on this side of the, of the railroad track and one on the other side. Okay, when you're talking about or you're, you're constructing crossings at at-grade railroad tracks, the surface of the crossing must be, of course, stable, firm, and slip resistant, and it must be level and flush with the top of rail at the outer edges, as well as the area in between the two rails. So you want to have a flush, smooth surface there, which is necessary and required by the ADA. And in addition to these surface features of the crossing, there could be additional safety features, uh, and there's additional guidance for that uh, in the MUTCD that could be um, that could be considered during design and construction. Okay, as far as the placement of detectable warnings at the railroad, that's covered in FDM Figure 222.2.1. And it requires the detectable warning to be placed relative to the nearest rail of the crossing between six feet and 15 feet. And then the detectable warning should be placed a minimum of four feet from the side of, of the gates on the opposing side from the rail. So that, that kind of relates back to this picture here, it, that, that detectable warning surface is supposed to be four feet behind that traffic gate. Okay, on this slide, we're, this slide addresses the flangeway gaps. That's the, the horizontal gaps that you see there next to the steel railroad rail. And those flangeway gaps do have a, a, a maximum requirement, and that is an ADA requirement. For pedestrian railways, the crossing, or the flangeway gap rather, cannot, be, cannot exceed two and a half inches. For non-freight, um, that's for non-freight rail track, uh, usually pedestrian trains. And then you have freight rail tracks, are let, that flangeway gap is limited to three inches. And there, there are some product vendors that have uh, tried to address that gap issue, and they provide basically a, a hard rubber product that is inserted into the, the gap, and the train wheel is able to essentially push that hard rubber out of the way as the train passes through, but then the, the rubberized product rebounds, if you will, and then and fills in the gap. But at, to my knowledge, there's nothing like that that's currently on the APL, so that would, that would require a little bit more work to use. Another thing to draw to your attention here is to preferably keep the pedestrian crossing exactly perpendicular to the railway crossing because you can imagine if the pedestrian crossing is at an angle with the, the that flangeway gap 
then the effective width of that flangeway gap is increased just by the geometry of the of the intersection and um, and that increases the likelihood that the front wheel or even the back the rear wheel of a of a mobility device like a wheelchair could get caught in the flangeway gap and that would put the pedestrian in extreme danger to to be stuck there in the in the flangeway gap we're not going to talk a lot about refuge islands other than to say that they are covered in chapter 210.3 of the FDM. So if you have interest on refuge islands, that's where that information can be found. Curb extensions, uh, I mentioned earlier, they're called bulb outs, can be used and, and the reason why that increases safety is it brings the pedestrian closer to the travel way while they're still standing on the relative safety of the curb but the motorists have a better visibility of the individual waiting to cross. Okay, um, section 2.7 references chapter 232.6 for information on pedestrian signals. Uh, this particular picture was again taken right across the street from the, the FDOT headquarters in Tallahassee. This is Cascades Park and it's showing there the the ped push button that's on the the ped head pole and in this case it looks like unfortunately the level landing that's required in front of the ped push button wasn't provided standard plans indexes 653 001 and 665 001 cover uh, pedestrian detectors now this this slide looks a little busy and uh lots of information being um being provided here but i'm going to walk you through it if you look at the button in the foreground of the picture and then look at the the diagram if you will to the to the left of the picture you can see that it's indicating that the button and the sign were located exactly 90 degrees out of compliance that button is servicing the crossing that's indicated in the lower left corner. So the crossing is, is behind the, the picture taker, the photographer. So the button face and the sign face should be parallel with the direction of the crossing that they serve. And in this case, the, the face of the button and the face of the sign were installed perpendicular to the crossing, which is exactly 90 degrees out of compliance. Same thing happened in the the pole on the far uh, side of the picture. The button and the sign were installed with the faces perpendicular to the crossing instead of parallel with the crossing, which is the appropriate direction. And that's not just an FDOT requirement, but that is in the, the national uh, standards, the MUTCD. So as folks on the construction side of the house, this is something to make sure that that the inspectors and, and, and the contractors to begin with should understand that the buttons have to be placed appropriately parallel to the direction of crossing and not perpendicular. This is another picture addressing the same the same situation uh, in the lower bottom of the slide right above the words index 665001 you can see there pictorially um, we're trying to indicate to the contractors and, and inspectors the appropriate orientation of the button face and the sign relative to the direction of the crossing. It needs to be parallel. In the upper left corner by the by the red S asterisk, that's just showing the ADA requirements for the reach ranges to get to the button. Your the button face must be within 10 inches of the edge of the walking surface and the button can be placed no more than 48 inches high. So the, the DOT standard plans diagram is in the big red circle there, shows that DOT requires the button to, to be placed at three foot six inches plus or minus six inches. So that keeps it within the acceptable ADA reach range tolerance. Okay, and also at the bottom right corner, you can see that the 10 inch maximum horizontal reach range is um, our standard plans folks in central office are trying to bring that pole as close to the edge of the sidewalk surface as they can by providing a, um, 
a foundation that actually is embedded within the within the curb because if you put the the foundation behind the curb then you you get outside of that 10 inch maximum allowable and again that's not just a dot requirement um, that is from the mutcd it being echoed in the dot standards all right for this slide you have fdm chapter 225 for information on public transit facilities you want to provide a five foot minimum width sidewalk that connect the transit stop to the adjacent sidewalk or shared use path and proper location of the public transit facility and uh, configuration of the sidewalks should be coordinated with all the appropriate stakeholders that 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 could include the district bike ped coordinator district modal development office the district ada coordinator certainly district public transportation staff as well as the local public transit provider Chapter 266 of the FDM addresses pedestrian bridges, and we will not be talking about that uh, beyond this slide. So if you have a, a construction project with, with a ped bridge, um, you want to make sure that it's meeting the requirements that are shared there in Chapter 266. Shared use paths, I know we've mentioned them a couple of times, but we're not going to go into any more detail uh, other than to say that those requirements are covered in Chapter 224. Street furniture is covered in, uh, in, in the pedestrian facilities chapter 222, section 2.11. You want to make sure that your, your benches and, and light poles and everything else are kept within the right of way, but outside of the line of sight of motorists when they're trying to see other motorists on the approaching roadway or, or see pedestrians within the crosswalk. So you want to make sure your sight distances are not obstructed by the street furniture that's being installed. In the case of the picture there, again, that's in Tallahassee, that's on uh, US Highway 90. I'm trying to think that, I think that's a, a Publix shopping center entryway there. But you wanna make sure that those, those bus shelters and, and other facilities are not blocking the line of sight. All right, two detectable warnings. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more specifically about what they are and where they're to be located. And I wanted to emphasize here that detectable warnings are required once a sloped surface or a curb ramp is installed. And the reason for that is that without a curb ramp, you would have the curb continuous across that crossing. So a person with a, with a visual impairment, either no vision or low vision, could detect the presence of the curb and would know because of the curb that they're about to leave the sidewalk and enter the, the motorway or the traveled way of a vehicle. But the existence of that curb without a curb ramp means that a person with a mobility disability, would they, they would have a, a barrier there that they could not traverse and so they would not have the ability to cross the roadway there. So if you remove the curb, by providing the curb ramp, then the person with a, a visual disability needed to have something there to indicate that they were leaving the safety or the relative safety of the sidewalk and about to cross into a, into a roadway. And that's where the truncated dome grid pattern comes in, which we refer to as a detectable warning surface. So you, you can see in this particular installation, the designer or the contractor did a very good job of trying to align the, the dome grid pattern with the direction of travel. It's not, it doesn't look like it's, it's exact, but it's, he did a good job trying to, but let me just emphasize that the, the purpose of the detectable warnings is not to provide direction or alignment information. So it is not a requirement of the ADA, nor is it a requirement of the DOT that the dome pattern align with, with the crossing. It's a best practice. And of course, if it's possible to do it, you should do it but it's not a requirement. But that dome pattern obviously is a pattern that's detectable by cane or underfoot, and it indicates to the individual with a visual disability that they're at the interface of the, of the pedestrian facility and in, in the vehicle facility. Now here, here's the, the pork, chop, pork Chop Island that I mentioned earlier, and the purpose of this slide is to show that detectable warnings must cover the full width 
of the walking surface, they must be two feet deep in the direction of pedestrian travel, and they must be provided at all curb ramps and trans transition areas at street crossings. They must be provided at pedestrian refuge islands, like the one pictured here, the Porkchop Island, um, especially where there's more than one of the following, where there's a change in surface texture, a change in elevation, in other words, it's a curbed refuge island, a change in horizontal alignment, which you can see is definitely occurs if you're um, trying to cross and use this this uh, pork chop island, and then uh, if it's a two two stage crossing, then detectable warnings are required. They are required on sidewalks at the following locations. Continued pedestrian at grade railroad crossings, commercial driveways with a stop or yield sign or a traffic signal but they are not required at residential driveways as we discussed earlier. They're also required at boarding and alighting areas that are adjacent to roadways, especially where there is an at grade or flushed um, connection to the roadway. And you can see that that's a good illustration in the picture there. And detectable warning surfaces are also required at railroad boarding platforms that are not otherwise protected by screens or guards. So again, you don't want to visually impaired individual to step off the platform into the into the rail railway bed which could be a significant you know three or four foot drop maybe so you protect that platform edge with the detectable warning surface this um, slide indicates that detectable warnings are not required at residential driveways not only are they not required they're not recommended and should be avoided at residential driveways because you don't want to dilute the intended message of the detectable warning surface by by over by their overuse and there's further guidance provided in standard plans index 522.002 for detectable warnings Detectable warnings are covered in the specs in section 527. And again, the depth of the detectable warning must be two feet in the direction of travel, and they must be located no greater than five feet from the back of curb. And that's illustrated pretty well in the picture below on the bottom left. You see that the, there's a five foot max distance from the back of curb at the longest dimension until it, it, in, until it meets the detectable warning. So five foot maximum for the detectable warning placement from the longest dimensions back of curb. And then where that distance is going to be exceeded, then the detectable warning surface needs to be placed radially as shown in the bottom right. Detectable warnings that are placed on asphalt should consider designers and, and I guess contractors as well should consider placing a concrete strip for the detectable warning. And the reason for that is that there currently we don't have a, a detectable warning surface product on our APL that is used or that is intended for use in asphalt. We only have concrete approved APL detectable warning surfaces. So because of that, um, the recommendation is to place a, a small, you know, four or five foot concrete strip at the end or at the interface with the roadway where you have to install detectable warning surfaces. Drop-off hazards have to be pr protected. I mentioned that before. This is a, a case of a newly constructed project, and I'm not sure if it was quite finished or not. I don't know if they're going to come back in and, and install um, shielding or handrail at this location, but it would certainly be my recommendation, even if it doesn't strictly meet the requirements of requiring shielding. Just as an en engineer of record, it would, I would be inclined probably to provide some sort of shielding here. Here's the, the requirements for shielding, though, where a slope is steeper than one to two, and it begins within two feet of the edge of the walking surface, and the drop-off is greater than 60 inches. See, it gets pretty particular, um, but it also says that, that depending on the height of the slope and the severity of the conditions, cases that, that don't rigorously meet this criteria um, can still be considered as having shielding to protect that, that pedestrian from the drop-off hazard. Pedestrian railings, we're going to go through these um, slides kind of quickly because um, the, you need to read the information and kind of digest it a little bit more thoroughly than we can do in this class. 
but uh, suffice it to say that existing ped rails and pipe rails should be removed if they are within the lateral offset requirement of the curb roadway and if they're within the clear zone of high-speed curb roadways. This is US 319 Thomasville Road on the north side of Tallahassee uh, heading out of town. Pedestrian railings on 3R three, three projects. It goes into some specifics here about documented traffic crashes and if, they, if those crashes involved pedestrians or if, if the handrail contributed to the severity of the situation and so forth. So I would encourage designers and, and even the construction folks to, to understand this section. And the idea here is to eliminate the hazard. If not, then it can be allowed to remain. But there needs to be an engineering evaluation that, that helps to, to guide that decision. Okay, finally, we've gotten to the construction portion. This is where all of the design requirements that we've just been discussing from Section 222 or Chapter 222 of the FDM are translated or brought forward into the construction environment. This is covered actually in the FDOT design manual, chapter 240 or 240. And it discusses here that a transportation management plan is required to minimize delay and traffic crashes resulting from construction activity. And you wanna do that by managing traffic through that area rather than just uh, turning it loose, I suppose. For traffic management plans, significant projects are defined as a project that either alone or by itself is anticipated to have sustained work zone impacts. All interstate system projects within the boundaries of a TMA, a transportation management area, and that will occupy that location for more than three days with either intermittent or continuous lane closures. So both of those criteria, number one and number two, are used to define a significant project. And when you are putting together your TMP, you want to make sure you coordinate with all of your appropriate stakeholders. This should be a multidiscipline effort, and you want to include folks from your FHWA Florida division. You want to include local government as well as business representatives as you're putting together that TMP to make sure that you're covering all of your elements, make sure your I's are dotted and T's are crossed. And this just real quickly shows you a form in the FDM that is required to be completed to help make sure that, that all of the appropriate checkpoints are being provided within your TMP. And in addition to following FDM Chapter 240, you need to follow the uh, these additional documents, which include the MUTCD, the AASHTO Green Book, the AASHTO Roadside Design Guide, the Standard Plans Index 102 series, as well as 711 for pavement markings. You have the FDOT Standard Specs, the Base of Estimates, FDOT Accessing Transit Handbook, you have the AASHTO Guide for the Development of Bicycle Facilities. So these are other guidance documents that should be considered during the development of the TMP. And again, the purpose of a TMP is to provide strategies that manage the work zone impacts and the scope, content, and degree of detail will vary, of course, depending on the expected what the expected impacts are. And you want to make sure that a, that a good TMP includes components such as the traf temporary traffic control plan, otherwise or previously known as MOT, maintenance of traffic as well as the Transportation Operations Plan and the Public Information Plan, the PIP. The TTCP, the Temporary Traffic Control Plan, is required for all work zones within adjacent to highways and roads and streets as specified by Florida statute as well as federal regulations. Some typical applications and approaches and mitigation strategies are included in MUTCD and some of them have been modified to be FDOT specific in the standard plans 102 series. And most of the standard plans or most of the details provided in the standard plans will need to have further development in order to address project specific conditions. The standard plans should not be viewed necessarily as a one size fits all approach, but the 
temporary traffic control should be tailored or customized to the project specific conditions. And the modes of travel that need to be accommodated in the temporary traffic control plan include pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit users. That even includes users of the Florida National Scenic Trail and Sun Trail. This slide is meant to emphasize the, the fact that ADA requirements apply just as strongly in a temporary traffic control condition as they do in the design of brand new facilities. So all those design requirements that we discussed in 222 have a direct translation when bringing forward to, to the construction work zone environment. And the provisions for the disabled at the, must be provided at the same level of accessibility as the existing facility or greater. And you're directed at the bottom of the screen to, to the standard specs section 102 as well as FDM 222 and 225 for additional information in that regard. You want to minimize impacts to existing bicycle facilities and you want to preserve the following to the greatest extent possible and that would be safety features, the connectivity of the facility, and the directness of route. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time verbally reading these points to you, but I am going to try to hit some of the, the, the main points and you can see there in point number one that you want to provide like for like facilities. So if you're working on a bike facility and, and you're disrupting an existing bike facility, a like for like facility should be provided for that closed or otherwise disrupted facility. Same thing for pedestrian walkways. And you want to keep bicyclists and motorized vehicles separated in the construction environment as much as possible. But again, some key points to to take away from the, this series of slides is that ADA requirements are, are in full force and effect in the construction environment and work zone environment just as they are in the design of a you know new construction final facility. When closing an existing facility a like for like comparison or a like for like facility must be pro provided during construction. So if you close a sidewalk, you have to provide an alternate pedestrian sidewalk that leads to the same places. Point number two there is that phase construction should be planned well enough so that, that your pedestrian and bicycle facilities are clo only closed when absolutely necessary. This is the picture that was taken during a QAR, I believe in District 5, and you can see there that the, the contractor is successfully using that MobiMat product that I mentioned on the very first slide in order to provide a firm, stable, and slip-resistant walking surface even though the, the ground is otherwise unimproved for this temporary walking facility. And it's just a dirt and grass, but the MobiMat definitely meets the requirements of the ADA by providing a, a stable, firm, and slip-resistant walking surface. And again, I want to reference Standard Plans Index Series 102 to provide additional information when providing pedestrian facilities through work zones. Temporary barriers per the FDM Chapter 215 should be deployed as appropriate. And, and especially when you're using that to divert pedestrian traffic to adjacent vehicular traffic. In other words, you're using a paved shoulder, which would otherwise be reserved for the use by motor vehicles for your pedestrian traffic. And you want to ensure your work zones that are your work zones that are adjacent to sidewalks or temporary pedways provide sufficient separation between the pedestrian and the work area. Location of temporary routes for pedestrian bicyclists. This is the where to put your temporary route. You don't want to lead pedestrians and bicycles into conflict with any of the work activities or the adjacent traffic. Uh, that stands to reason. You want to keep detour lengths and diversions as short as possible or practicable, it says. And uh, paragraph 2A there goes into some very specific guidelines 
on um, keeping those detour links in check. And paragraph 2B at the bottom there says to minimize the detour length, consider providing temporary mid-block crossings where that will help keep the diversion length shorter. Paragraph 3 says the pre preference for routing is to maintain the facility on the same side of the road. And that these are these are MUTCD requirements that are just being echoed by the DOT uh, FDM Chapter 240. But you want to keep the facility on the same side of the road. If you have to go to the opposite side of the road, you want to return to the same side of the road as soon as possible. And if you have to go to another road, you want to return them to the original road and the original side of the road as soon as possible. If you have transit stops within the limits of your project, then you want to make sure that you're adequately providing alternative means for the pedestrian to access the transit stop as well as to access the transit vehicle for boarding and departing. And you want to provide, and you're required by the FDM to provide the same level of accessibility as the existing facility or greater. You cannot reduce the level of accessibility just because you're in a construction work zone environment. Drop-offs are covered in chapter 240, section 2114, and additional traffic control devices are covered by the MUTCD. They have detailed instructions there, but Florida has made Florida-specific requirements, and all that's discussed at detail or, or shown in detail in the Index 102 series. And you don't want to place your traffic control devices in an area that will interfere with the, the smooth flow of tra uh, transit stops, ped pedestrians, or bicycle traffic. Signs are typically used traffic control devices, you want to make sure that they're they're used appropriately and in a, um, compliance with the Standard Plans 102 series. And signing for the control of traffic needs to be adequate to inform drivers, cyclists, PEDs of the work zone conditions, and at minimum, you want to alert potential users that the road work is ahead. You want to make sure that they're, they're aware that they're entering into a construction zone. If the work zone interrupts the continuity of an existing bicycle or ped, pedway, then provide signs directing non-motorists around the work zone and back to the bike or pedway. What you see pictured here, are, are, they're called LCDs or longitudinal channelizing devices. They are a, an excellent way of delineating the intended temporary pedestrian way. So the temporary pedestrian way here is appropriately delineated, but I'm not sure or certain that the grassy surface would be considered by the ADA as being stable, firm, and slip resistant. So here would be a good place to deploy the, uh, the Moby Mat or a similar product. Okay, LCDs, longitudinal channelizing devices, are covered in the MUTCD section 6F. They are a very effective way of indicating where pedestrian ways are closed and they should be placed across the full width of the closed facility so that there's no way at all for an individual to mistakenly go, go through that barrier. So if, if it's the full width, then there's, it's not possible for them to, to get around it. LCDs can also be used to shield or keep pedestrians and bicyclists away from drop-off hazards. Uh, in locations where the active work zone is within two feet of the sidewalk or pedestrian walkway, they can also be used on, and should be used on both sides of the temporary pedestrian walkway. And where a vehicular barrier is being used, an LCD doesn't have to be used on that side of the, the walkway. Temporary traffic control devices such as signals have to be located in such a way that, that the pedestrian can use them and knows where they are and, and it's obvious as to which crossing they are serving. So all of those were pretty much covered pretty extensively in Chapter 222 and those same requirements are brought forward 
into construction, the, the construction environment in Chapter 240 of the FDM. So if there is an existing pedestrian accommodation that is being closed or altered during construction, then that work zone and temporary traffic control plan needs to accommodate the same or, or at least provide an alternative access for that situation. Law enforcement is a commonly used temporary traffic control device. It increases the awareness of passing vehicular traffic as well as improving the safety through the work zone. Traffic control officers will hopefully increase the respect of the traveling public, whether they're pedestrian or vehicular travelers, to the work zone environment. The transportation's operation plan, or the top, contains strategies to improve mobility through the work zone and increase access and safety. Strategies in the top include the work zone intelligent transportation systems, or ITS, and also incident management, which may include like the uh, road rangers. Table 240.3.1 provides common items that are used in the transportation operation plan and a top should be considered for significant projects as uh, I told you were defined in section 240.1. Also an important aspect or um, constituent component of a effective transportation management plan is the public information plan or the PIP is that it's going to communicate to the affected parties and traveling public and project stakeholders all of the changes that are going to be in effect during the construction zone and construction activities. And the PIP will also describe the most efficient method for communicating all of this information to the uh, appropriate or target audience. And the PIP should be integrated with the community awareness plan for the project, the, the CAP. When the CAP is to include communication strategies, the PIP should be considered again for significant project I find it earlier and more information on that can be found in FDM 104 as well as the public involvement handbook and the PD&E manual. The Office of Construction provides training relative to the temporary traffic control and uh, you can see there that it's still being referred to as maintenance of traffic because that was such a, a long used historical term when, when it was changed to temporary traffic control, a lot of the people with experience still refer to it as the MOT. But uh, that is offered by the State Construction Office and you can contact uh, Susan Robeson's section or actually look on online first and try to try to find that schedule online for when those classes are offered. And that brings us to the end of the presentation portion. Uh, my contact information is provided on this slide and my phone number and my email address are all provided there as well as the um, address for the department's ADA website, which is at dot.gov forward slash roadway forward slash ADA. But before I let you go, I did want to go through a, another several slides, I think it's a dozen or, or so, to show you just some best practices or not so best practices. So you see here on the picture on the left, this is a work zone where the pedestrian, the public transit facility has not necessarily been adequately accommodated. Uh, so the question here that might go through your mind is how in the world did the pedestrian get to this place to begin with? How is the bus going to know that a pedestrian is waiting there? How is the bus going to get there? So these are all things that should be considered within the transportation management plan. And the picture on the right side of the screen, that is a great message to be communicated to the traveling public. The only problem with it is, is that the pedestrian who's traveling along the, the concrete sidewalk here will have to very carefully navigate through that grassy utility strip or may even have to step off the curb into the roadway to get a, get around that sign. So while the sign is communicating a, a great message to increase motorist awareness, it can't be placed in such a way that it's going to place pedestrians into harm's way. Here is a 
picture on the left that, that is meant to communicate to you a point that I had intended to have already made that plastic tape and cones is not effective use of temporary pedestrian facility or closures. Uh, you can see here that a pedestrian with a low or no vision could very easily walk right past that sidewalk closed sign and through the tape and end up in harm's way over that modified walking surface area there. On the on the right side of the screen, you can see that that single barricade has been placed over those uh, conduit that are that are extending up out of the ground. That's not an effective use, or that's not an effective or allowed way to close that area off. It might be better here to use in both cases, both pictures, the uh, LCDs, the longitudinal channelizing devices to just block off the entire width. The picture on the upper left is a lot closer to a good installation, certainly within the, the barrier flume there that's created for the, for the pedestrian access route that provides a detectable edge that is detectable with a cane or, or even the top surface of the barrier by hand. The only problem with this is that I would definitely recommend the use of LCDs to act as the funnel to that entryway instead of those barricades in that cone. Same situation in the bottom right. The fabric netting there, if you will, and the barricade with a sign is not an effective way to close in that it's definitely not ADA compliant. Picture on the left is a situation there where probably you would not want to lead pedestrians all the way to this point if it's just going to terminate and there's no logical crossing or continuation of the of the pedestrian facility there. So rather than bringing them all that way and then having to make them turn around or cross in the traffic, you'd want to provide a appropriate pedestrian closure at a logical crossing point. Same situation in the upper right is that the, the cones and the, the plastic netting there is not going is not a compliant, an ADA compliant way. And it and all of this information is in the MUTCD as well as the FDM and standard plans index 102. But that netting and cones and plastic tape are not permitted on DOT projects. Similar situation upper left, lower right shows you a situation that is that has been created for the particular individual where they're now being forced into the seemingly into the traveled way and that is a, a dangerous hazardous situation that needs to be avoided during a during construction some similar situations here the walking surface that's being provided there is certainly doesn't seem to be firm stable and slip resistant nor does it seem to be uh, unobstructed looks like there's some at least some asphalt millings or something a pile of it there and there's definitely sand and debris in the way. On the upper right corner, you've got the plastic tape and the, the cones that are not allowed. Some other situations where your sidewalk closure information and, and crossing guidance should be provided uh, before you get this far. Picture on the bottom left is showing how overhead construction may necessitate the addition of uh, protection on, I guess, roof roof protection, if you will, protection from falling items from above during construction. So, likely not going to happen unless you're in a an urban setting with your state roadway. In the upper right corner is a temporary ramp that has been installed to help traverse a temporary pedestrian facility. The curb there is uh, would be a barrier otherwise. The picture on the right again shows the, a good use of the LCDs, but that is a rather abrupt ending to the concrete walking surface, and then it goes right into what looks like some overgrown grassy area, which probably presents a barrier to certain types of people with with mobility disabilities, and that overgrown grassy um, walking surface 
is more than likely not going to be considered to be stable, firm, or slip resistant. The LCD is on the right. That's a very good installation, and it's all you know detectable and a nice wide um, temporary path for pedestrians. On the left is pretty good, except the width between those barriers probably is not five feet. I don't I don't think this is a, a picture from Florida, but in Florida you'd want it to at least be five feet wide. And again, the use of barricades like that and a little sign with an arrow is not sufficient. The use of LCDs would be a, a better way of kind of funneling your pedestrian traffic into the desired temporary traffic control plan there. Similar situation in both of these pictures. Here you, on the right, you can see that that is an appropriate use of a barricade because the, the bottom horizontal rail is within, I think the requirement is two inches of the walking surface. So it's detectable by cane as well as um, the hand trailing along the top there. But uh, the, the use of modern LCDs would probably be an even better choice for sidewalk closures. Again, a, a picture of what not to do in the upper right and lower left looks to be, to me, like a, a good use of the LCDs. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. So I would like to entertain any questions you may have. We do have a question. Since the national standards, federal and FDOT guidelines have different minimum sidewalk widths, what is the minimum sidewalk width at what width is a design variation needed? Okay, that's a good question. And in the case of a design variation or, or for a state project, let's say for a state project, you're required to meet the requirements or the criteria of the FDM, which is a five foot standard sidewalk minimum. So if you're going to be less than five foot, that's when you would have to work with your district design engineer to process a design variation for ADA. I've got a question. In, in your opinion, if we can't get the minimum, uh, is it better just to provide nothing? Give me a, a for instance. So say you can only meet, uh, you can only meet the th like three or three and a half foot wide sidewalk in a, in a few locations, maybe a few hundred feet like for a block, one block, uh, mm. where we might have tight right away in an urban area. I mean, I, in my mind, I think you would still want to provide it, but we would need an exception at that point, right? Yeah, I, I agree with your assessment. In that case, because of the, the importance of keeping pedestrians out of the vehicular way, which is you know one of the main purposes of a sidewalk, you definitely want to provide as much as you can. In fact, the ADA has a phrase um, maximum extent feasible. So I, there's nowhere in, in the ADA regulations that requires you to move a building if you don't have sufficient right-of-way for the proper width of the sidewalk. And the DOT is certainly not going to require you to move a building. So yeah, I think I think you, you hit the nail on the head. You'd want to okay. provide the maximum you can, the maximum width you can, but you'd still have to run it through your DBE and it, it would probably still require design variation, but it would, I think it would be a very simply written uh, report at that point. Okay, that's always been my understanding, so I'm just want to make sure that you guys are on the same page. Yep, you got it. Um, so the Pro Ag has been around for a very long time, as you mentioned, and I think one of the things that the Pro Ag was talking about before was being able to match the roadway grade. Um, would that also apply to curb ramps or transitions? Is that still like something that they're looking at? Well, the allowance in PROAG for the sidewalk that's adjacent to and parallel with the, the road, the roadway, being allowed to follow the profile grade line applies only to the sidewalk. The curb ramps are still subject to the, um, the maximums. However, you still have that, that that provision that says that a curb ramp only needs to be extended for 15 feet maximum in order to try to comply with that uh, 1 to 12 maximum slope. Otherwise, if you can't meet it, you just have to go as far as 15 feet and do the best you can. Does, does that answer your question? 
Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. When you spoke to the longitudinal devices for traversing the pedestrians, in the photos where the LCDs were over grass, it appeared that this, there was never a sidewalk through that grass, that the sidewalk had ended mm -hmm. where it does. So then to match the like for like, or better, to install those devices shows that people do walk through there. It was never concrete or, there we go, that it was never concrete or paved to begin with. Does mm -hmm. putting the devices then put the onus on to the department, AKA forcing the hand of the contractor to make that the stable non-slip area where it hadn't been before? Yes. Yes, any any time we're we're specifically providing a pedestrian facility, even if it's a temporary one, because an existing one was an existing one located somewhere else is being closed, and we're directing we're if we're directing pedestrians to a temporary facility, then it has to meet the ADA requirements, which would include a, a surface that is firm, stable, and slip resistant. Okay, well, I see now in this picture that there, there is a sidewalk to the right that had been used. Mm -hmm. Now this one is a temporary one. I was just thinking of a situation where this where there was never a sidewalk surface. Yeah, I, I think. Let's see. I think you had referenced that one. That picture. Yeah, yes, obviously. I think that one, it's like maybe there was never a a concrete sidewalk to begin with, but now we are mm -hmm. channeling them because obviously people walk there. Then. Do we force the hand to make that the stable, non-slippery, traversable yes. surface? Yes. Yes. Okay. And my my recommendation would definitely be to meet the requirements of the ADA and provide the firm, stable, and slip resistant. And it could be as simple. And I don't know how much the Moby mat is, but it could be as simple as as just rolling out that Moby mat or, or similar product over the grass. Yeah, that sounds like a nice product. Great. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. Well, hopefully everybody has a, a copy of my contact information, my phone number and my email address, and feel free to reach out at any time, and I will definitely do the best I can to, uh, to answer your question or get it to the appropriate person who can answer it.